Hello, my dear friends. Today, we will discuss about esophageal cancer. So, in brief, we will discuss regarding the epidemiology, the risk factors of esophageal cancer, the clinical presentation, diagnosis, staging, and treatment of esophageal cancer. Coming to the epidemiology of esophageal cancer. We can see that the squamous cell carcinoma is more common in the upper two-thirds of the esophagus and adenocarcinoma is more common in the lower one-third of esophagus. Then adenocarcinoma has a rising trend in the West. What does that mean? Yes, squamous cell carcinoma is the most common worldwide. But adenocarcinoma has a rising trend because due to the increased obesity and gastroesophageal reflux diseases in the West, there will be gastroesophageal reflux and there will be a higher amount of Barrett's esophagus because of the acid reflux towards the lower part of the esophagus and an increasing trend in the adenocarcinoma of esophagus. Coming to the epidemic, continuing with the epidemiology, the incidence of esophageal cancer. It is more common in males compared to the females. Coming towards the heat map, you can see the amount of esophageal cancer is more common in Asia, Southern Africa, and the Latin American countries. Whereas in the American countries or the Western countries, the total incidence of esophageal cancer is less. Risk factors of esophageal cancer. You can see the male patient, obese patient, smoking, alcoholism, red meat, all these are risk factors of esophageal cancer. Esophageal motility disorders is another risk factor of esophageal cancer. Now, H. pylori infection fruits and vegetables fibers fruits and vegetables are helpful are favorable risk factors in esophageal cancer how come h pylori infection decrease esophageal cancer fruits fibers vegetables we can understand antioxidants improved motility but how come h pylori infection you see I already said that Barrett's esophagus is a, there is a high incidence of adenocarcinoma in Barrett's esophagus. Barrett's esophagus is due to the exposure of the lower esophagus to gastric acid. So when there is helicobacter pylori infection, it can cause gastric atrophy, gastric mucosal atrophy and decrease the acid production, which in turn will decrease the Barrett's esophagus and which in turn will decrease the esophageal adenocarcinoma. So that is how helicobacter pylori is a favorable risk factor in case of esophageal cancer. Coming to clinical presentation of esophageal cancer. It can present with dysphagia, foot not passing, difficulty in swallowing dysphagia, regurgitation and vomiting, the food in the esophagus will get regurgitated, Odinophagia, there is pain while swallowing, recurrent laryngeal nerve palsy. We can see that the, the recurrent laryngeal nerve is in the tracheoesophageal groove. Especially we can do during thyroid surgery, we may see the recurrent laryngeal nerve. It between the thyroid and it between the trachea and the esophagus is the recurrent laryngeal nerve. So, especially in upper esophageal tumors, there can be a recurrent laryngeal nerve palsy and hoarseness of voice. Then Horner syndrome. Suppose an esophageal tumor, and especially an upper esophageal or mid esophageal tumor, is involving the set stellate ganglion, it can cause Horner syndrome, which include ptosis, meiosis, anhydrosis, and inophthalmos. Then phrenic nerve is also passing through the mediastinum. So suppose an esophageal tumor is involving the phrenic nerve, it can cause diaphragmatic palsy. Diagnosis of esophageal cancer. It can be done first by upper GI endoscopy. When we perform an upper GI endoscopy, we will find an esophageal lesion. 
Now, in earlier studies, earlier days, barium swallow was done in earlier times. So, when the barium is present in the esophagus and the esophagus is visualized, it is called barium swallow. If it is in the stomach and the stomach is visualized, this is called the barium meal. So, suppose the, if the barium is in the esophagus, it is called the barium swallow. In earlier times, before the advent of endoscopy, barium was the preferred visual preferred for visualization of the esophageal malignancy where we can see a filling defect or where we can see a shouldering of the barium well while it passed through the tumor segment we have done a barium and we have find done a biopsy what will we see we can either identify a squamous cell carcinoma or we can see a result as adenocarcinoma the pathologist will see this then what will we do next the next is staging of the esophageal cancer what is the staging it is the classical tnm staging tumor known and metastasis staging so we will identify the tumor how far the tumor is infiltrating towards the esophageal wall then we will see how many number of nodes are visualized nodes are there and we will see whether there is a metastasis liver metastasis is common in esophageal tumors now, before understanding the uh, T staging, tumor staging, we have to understand the different layers of the esophageal musculature, esophagus. So, one is the epithelium, the, there is epithelium, there is basement membrane, there is lamina propria, muscularis mucosa. All these come under the mucosa. Then there is submucosa, then muscularis propria. Muscularis propria has two layers. We already know that. There is a inner circular layer and the outer longitudinal layer. Then comes the adventitia. You see in esophagus there is only adventitia and there is no serosa as such. Now coming to the T staging. In T staging we can see the T1 lesions, T1A and T1B lesions are in the mucosa. These lesions are just restricted to the mucosa and submucosa. T1A lesion is completely in the mucosa. T1B lesion is crossing and reaching the submucosa. Coming to T2 lesions. T2 lesions invade the muscularis propria, the circular and the longitudinal muscular fibers. T3 lesions, the tumor reaches the adventitia but it does not infiltrate the adjacent structures. T4 lesions, the adventitial structures are penetrated or the adventitial structures are infiltrated. If I, uh, the pleura is infiltrated, it is called T4, it is T4A and if the iota is infiltrated, it is T4B. Coming to the end staging. End staging, if 1 to 2 nodes are positive, it is N1, 3 to 6 nodes are positive, it is N2 and 7 or more nodes are positive is N3. And M1 is if there is metastasis. Staging investigations in case of esophageal cancer. Now we have, now we know the TNM staging. We know what is staging. So next is how will we reach the staging? We understood the biopsy. We know the type of cancer, squamous or adeno, from the endoscopy biopsy. We know the staging from the, we have the knowledge of staging, that how will we stage, how will we reach this stage? The difference investigation used at CECT thorax and abdomen, endoscopic ultrasound, ultrasound abdomen, especially for metastasis, C, uh, PET CT for metastasis and laparoscopy for peritoneal metastasis, PET CT for distant metastasis. So we can understand that the different investigations, especially in, in TNM, these different investigations focus on different parts of it. Some, in, some investigation focus on the T part, some investigation focus on the N part, and some on the metastatic part. So, CECT thorax abdomen. CECT thorax abdomen can, helpful, can be helpful in both T and, T, N and M. So, the primary lesions can be, this is the esophagus, this is the trachea with the air inside it. This is the esophagus and this is the lung. And this is a lesion inside the esophagus. So, the T staging and the nearby nodes can also be visualized in the CECT thorax and abdomen. Metastasis can be visualized. If you can see the liver metastasis in case of an esophageal tumor. Now coming to the endoscopic ultrasound. The next investigation is endoscopic ultrasound. What is the advantage of the endoscopic ultrasound? 
we can clearly and beautifully see the different layers of the esophagus in case of endoscopic ultrasound. We can see the mucosa here, we can see the submucosa here, we can see hypoechoic muscularis propria here. So the different layers of esophagus are beautifully delineated in endoscopic ultrasound. What is an endoscopic ultrasound? Is it is exactly like an endoscope, an endos an, like an endoscopy, an endoscopy is passed, but instead of the picture like uh, instead of the live picture we see a shadow the endoscopic picture in case of endoscopic ultrasound we can see clearly see a lesion especially endoscopic ultrasound is clan clearly delineated for uh, uh, delineate, delineate t and n lesion t, t stage and n stage you can see this tumor is infiltrating this one is the this black is the muscularis propria and this tumor is infiltrating the muscularis propria but it has not reached the adventitia so an endoscopic ultrasound can clearly delineate it as a t2 stage that is the advantage of endoscopic ultrasound over the ct scan nodes if associated with the esophagus it will be found around here if nodes are associated with the esophagus it is also clearly visualized in endoscopic ultrasound now coming to the PET CT scan. PET CT scan, what exactly is PET CT scan? We see, you see, the, the, the tissues which metabolize the glucose highly are the, one is the heart or the kidney and then or the brain and then it is the malignant tissues. What the PET CT, in, in PET CT scan we give a 5 fluorodeoxyglucose. Once it enters the cell and it gets metabolized, it cannot come out easily. So there will be a concentration of 5-fluorodeoxyglucose in highly metabolizing tissues. So give, we give it to this patient. So malignant cells, we know that it is highly metabolizing. So those cells, those 5-fluorodeoxyglucose will get concentrated on these cells. Here we can see a lower esophageal cancer and a metastatic liver lesion. Okay, this picture, this uh, pet, uh, pet picture, uh, PET pet picture is superimposed on a CT scan picture to see the classical picture of PET CT scan which has both an anatomical delineation and a functional delineation where there is increased metabolization of 5-fluorodeoxyglucose. So, it is better suited for M staging, metastatic staging of the tumors. Now comes the bronchoscopy. Sometimes there is infiltration into the surrounding tissues. So how will we find the infiltration into trachea? For that we can use bronchoscopy. In bronchoscopy we can see these are the tracheal rings and this is the infiltration of the tumor, esophageal tumor in towards the trachea. After that comes laparoscopy. Why laparoscopy? Because after all these lesions, all these investigations, sometimes diffuse peritoneal metastasis may be missed in the CT scan. So, a preoperative laparoscopy may be helpful, may, may be helpful especially in identifying peritoneal metastasis. These are the peritoneal metastasis we are seeing. After, so we have staged the disease by all these things. Now, as laparoscopy we may not do. Uh, but, but all the other investigations we can do to make sure the T, N and M staging of the esophageal cancer. Once we make sure that we can go for a preoperative investigation. The anesthetist has a role in esophageal surgery. We will come to it. So what are our treatment options? Our treatment options are endoscopic resection, endoscopic mucosal resection, surgical resection. Surgical resection can be of the, the three types. Iverlui, Machion and Oringer, we will come to it and we can go for a chemo radiation. Chemo radiation can either be a neoadjuvant chemo radiation or a postoperative chemo radiation after the surgery. So what exactly is endoscopic mucosal resection? Endoscopic mucosal resection uh, can be used for tumors in the mucosa or in the or infiltrating the submucosa. Okay. So, only the superficial lesions, endoscopic mucosal resection can be used. The mucosa can be, this is an endoscope and endoscope the, the lesion is sucked inside, a band is deployed and with the snare it is cut and this is the tumor resected area. So, tumor can be sucked inside and can be resected with a snare and this will give us a margin. 
So early lesion endoscopic mucosal resection can be done. This is not the only method for endoscopic mucosal resection. Another method is we can inject raise a wheel, inject saline, raise a wheel and inject saline and raise a wheel and put a snare and remove the tumor with the margin. So these are the methods for endoscopic mucosal resection in case of T1 lesions in esophageal cancer. Coming to the surgical options in esophageal cancers. One is Ivor Lewis surgery where the anastomosis is in the thorax. McKeown's three stage operation with the cervical anastomosis and a transhiatal oringer esophagectomy again with the cervical anastomosis. Whatever may be the surgery, what we are doing is resection of the esophagus with a proximal 10 cm margin and with a distal 5 cm margin for the tumor. That is the ideal margins. Then lymphadenectomy of the esophagus uh, surrounding lymph nodes. And finally, the reconstruction of the esophagus with a condui. The condui can be stomach, colon, jejunum, anything. Stomach, colon or jejunum. So this is a picture of Ivor Lewis operation. We can see the three steps. One, this is the esophageal tumor, esophageal cancer. The cancer is removed and the nearby surrounding tissues are removed and the esophagus is joined to the stomach. So this is done in two steps. One is the abdominal incision and next is the thoracotomy incision. In the, with the help of abdominal incision, we make the stomach into a tube. We will come to it. And through the thoracic incision, we will dissect the esophagus and we remove the tumor and the surrounding lymph nodes. But the anastomosis is in the thorax. Okay. Now, what is the role of anesthesia in especially during the pre uh, the, during the induction period in case of esophageal surgery. You see, when we do a thoracotomy, the lung will be moving. The lung will be filled with air. The anesthetist has to collapse the lung, the right side. We usually go for a right thoracotomy because in the left side there is the aorta and it is obstructing it, obstructing the esophagus. So we have to go for a right thoracotomy. Right thoracotomy, to be very, uh, the, to get a better view, we have to collapse the right lung and we have to ventilate the left lung. The anesthesia uses different technique for that. So, he, he, can, he, he can see a method. This is one method where we block the bronchus of one thing and we ventilate the other lung. This is another method where we block this bronchus with a double lumen tube. We ventilate one lung and we block other lung or a bronchial blocker or we can put an endobronchial tube. Instead of placing the tube inside the trachea, the tube can be pushed into one of the bronchus and ventilate that bronchus, cutting off the other lung from ventilation. So single lung ventilation is a requirement, especially in case of thoracotomy and uh, thoracic dissection. So these are the different methods. Now, what will happen if we don't make the stomach into a tube and anastomose? Suppose uh, if, if we anastomose the esophagus to stomach directly, it will appear like that. So what is the problem with this? When we take food, there will be the stomach will get distended. There will be regurgitation. There will be compression of the lung and the heart, causing multiple cardiovascular complications and collapse of the lung if the stomach is directly joined to the esophagus like this. So what should we do? We have for that we have to make the stomach into a tube like that before joining into the esophagus before reconstructing the esophagus we see the stomach we have the right and left gastric artery here and we have the right and left gastroepiploic vessels here so the stomach tube is made based on the blood supply of the right and left gastroepiploic vessels so that is the line of resection and staplers are applied like that to make a stomach tube like this and this stomach tube is pulled into the thorax to anastomose with the esophagus. So we put an abdominal incision, we put a thorac thoracic incision, from, from the abdominal incision we made the stomach into a tube, through the thoracic incision we dissected the esophagus, we removed the lymph node and we removed the specimen, then we pulled the uh, pull the stomach from the esophagus, stomach from the abdomen through the thoracotomy incision stomach tube and we anastomose it with the esophagus and close the incision. 
But what, what is the problem with the Iverloy operation? The anastomosis is a thoracic anastomosis. So suppose if there is a leak, then it becomes a problem. There will be mediastinitis, pleural effusion, pneumonia, and it will be difficult to manage a leak from the thoracic anastomosis. So McKeon came up with another idea. Why don't we shift this anastomosis into the cervical region or the neck? So for that he used three incision. The first two part is same. He threw the abdominal incision, he made the stomach into the tube. For, through the thoracic incision, uh, he anastomosed the esophagus, anast uh, he uh, dissected off the esophag esophageal tumor with adequate margin. But the, for the anastomosis of the esophagus to stomach tube, he used the cervical incision. In McKeon operation, this is the A1A2 is the McKeon and B1B2 is the Iverloy operation. The, here the anastomosis in the thorax and here the anastomosis in the cervical region. So anastomosis is shifted to the neck in case of a McKeon's three-stage operation. So stomach to tube by the abdominal incision, mobilization of the esophagus by the thoracic incision and cervical anastomosis in case of a McKeon three-stage operation. But three incisions. So three incisions, thoracic incision, all these cause a higher morbidity. So should we require these three incisions especially for a lower esophageal tumor? Oringer thought like that. And he developed a transhiatal esophagectomy. In transhiatal esophagectomy, the thoracic incision is avoided. And what he did was he opened the diaphragm. He from the neck the uh, esophagus is approached like that, and from the stomach he opened the diaphragm and esophagus is approached in that fashion. So the dissection at some part of the operation is a blind dissection. He puts the, the O-ringer operation, the hand is put like that and esophagus is dissected and sometimes some part of the operation will become a blind operation, uh, blind and only the feeling of the fingers is used. And uh, the, likewise, a transhiatal esophagectomy is done, a, but again the anastomosis is done in the cervical region. So what is the advantage of anastomosis in the neck? Even if any leak is there, it only comes outside. There may be a fistula, but that's all. There is no pleural effusion, no mediastinitis like a thoracic anastomosis. That is the advantage of transhiatal esophagectomy. Now, anastomosis in the neck, O-ringer operation, no thoracotomy. There is another advantage of O-ringer operation, over McKeown's operation. But it is only better suited for the lower one-third. In the middle esophageal tumors or the upper tumors, Anyway, a thoracotomy incision is better in the mid-esophageal tumor lesions because it may not be completely accessible through a transhiatal incision. So, what should, how should we decrease the morbidity and mortality morbidity in the upper and the middle lesions? Instead of using a thoracotomy to dissect the tumor, we can use a thoracoscopy. So, abdominal incision can be put. Make the stomach into a tube. Instead of a thoracotomy, do a thoracoscopy and dissect of the esophagus. Put a cervical incision and anastomose the stomach to the esophagus by pulling the esophagus towards the neck with the help of the thoracoscopy. Now, what are the postoperative complications? There can be, of course, intraoperative complications. Postoperative complications can be pulmonary complications, mainly pneumonia and lung collapse. Kandui related. Why am I using Kandui related instead of stomach tube? If stomach is not available or if there is some problem with the stomach, we can use a colon or we can use jejunum to reconstruct the esophagus instead of the stomach. But stomach is the best substitution for its first esophageal substitution. So Kandui related problems can be anastomotic leak. Then it can be Kandui ischemia and structure. So, so we know that the stomach tube, the blood supply is dependent upon the gastric artery, the gastro right and left gastroepiploic artery. If when we are pulling the stomach tube into the thorax, into the neck, there can be some amount of uh, injury to the vasculature and can it re can lead to the lead to the kandui ischemia, which will result in a stricture. So that is the problem. Another problem, then motility related disorders. This stomach which is now acting as the esophagus may not move or may not function like the esophagus properly. So, mortality related disorders can happen. Chylothorax, 
because there is a thoracic duct associated with esophagus there will be a thoracic duct injury which can lead to chylothorax recurrent laryngeal nerve injury especially in the cervical lesions cardiovascular complications diaphragmatic hernia even there is especially in the when the diaphragm is opened diaphragmatic hernia can happen in esophageal tumors and uh, phrenic nerve injury can also happen and cause diaphragmatic event in case diaphragmatic palsy in case of esophageal tumors so all these are the post-operative complications of esophageal now coming to the adjuvant therapy adjuvant therapy can be chemotherapy or and radiotherapy it can be either be given in in the form of a neoadjuvant form or it can be done post-operatively so neoadjuvant chemo radiation neoadjuvant chemo radio chemotherapy is given especially in the t2 t3 lesion category where it can be resected with margin so whether to go for a neoadjuvant chemotherapy or the whether to go for a post operative chemo radiation especially in the t2 especially in the t3 segment t3 lesions will de depend upon how confident the surgeon is to remove the tumor uh, without injuring the surrounding structures suppose if there is some amount of infiltration to the adventitia and the surrounding structures or if it is a larger tumor it is better to go for a neoadjuvant chemotherapy reduce the size and then go for the definitive surgery but suppose the tumor is small surgery can be done initially and then go for a post-operative chemo radiation suppose it is advanced stage lesion t4 lesion or multiple lymph node involvement or metastasis and the esophagus the esophageal tumor is associated with obstructing feeding or there is dysphagia or odinophagia we have to consider palliative treatment what are the palliative treatment options we have to feed the patient so bypass the esophagus and go for feeding gastrostomy that is one form of palliation another one is an esophageal stent we can see an esophageal tumor like this and we can in we can place the stent through an endoscope we can place an esophageal tumor esophageal stent in between the tumor so that the patient can feed well so that is regarding esophageal stent this is a placement of an esophageal stent after endoscopy after endoscopic placement of esophageal stent this is the picture so the patient can feed through that gap what is the prognosis of esophageal tumors the overall survival rates of patients after esophagectomy were 25% by 5 years that is 75% of the patients will die and 20.8% by 10 years so in brief we have discussed about the epidemiology of the esophageal cancer the distribution the squamous cell carcinoma the rising trend of adenocarcinoma then we have discussed about the risk factors the favorable risk, favorable factors like h pylori infection and the fruit fiber diet clinical presentation due to the local symptoms and the infiltration of the surrounding organs then the diagnosis by the endoscopy and biopsy and olden days barium the how to stage the disease and what are the methods what are the different investigations we use for staging and finally the treatment which included the mucosal treatment endoscopic treatment endoscopic mucosal resections the surgical treatment and the chemo radiotherapy and finally in advanced cases palliative treatment so that is regarding esophageal cancer thank you